So now we're going to move on to Amanda. She is um, a microbiologist and a recent PhD graduate working as a research associate at the University of Toronto. Uh, Dr. Amanda Vary helps support research programs exploring how microbes, especially fungi, can cause disease in humans. Earlier this week, she took over our Instagram channel to share her love of microbes. So please visit our Instagram, um, instagram.com forward slash RCI science and follow her takeover, which we've saved in the highlights. They were really fun, very visual. I loved them. So hopefully you guys can check those out as well. Welcome, Amanda. Thank you for joining us. Thanks for having me. No problem. I um I think uh, I have to apologize on behalf of the microbial world as um, fungi are actually one of the major causes of uh, bat extinction because of a, a syndrome called white nose syndrome that fun fungi cause that cause them to wake up from their hibernation and then they don't have enough energy to survive. Um, so I apologize. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for letting us know that as well. <laughs> very great connection. Um, I'm just gonna let people know to submit your questions as Amanda presents, feel free to do so. We can adjust them afterwards. Thank you so much. We can uh, take it over. Perfect. Great. Okay, so, um, as Celia said, my name is Dr. Amina Vary, and I am a microbiologist that works at the University of Toronto. So I'm going to talk to you today about whether you should fear the living dead. And I'm going to give you my guide to, my, uh, to zombies. The first thing I want you to do is very serious. I want you to imagine you're walking through the forest and you look down and you see these protrusions that we see on the slide here coming out of the ground. Now, the first thing you think is, could it really be a person was buried alive? Or is it a dead person that is coming back to life? And these are their fingers coming out of the ground. But actually, it's a mushroom. So this is a, a mushroom called Zylaria polymorpha, or dead man's fingers. And it's called that because it looks like dead man's fingers. And I wanted to share this to show you that sometimes nature can be just as scary, or if not scarier, than fiction. Perfect. Ooh. Okay, so as a microbiologist, I study microbes, and microbes are very small living things that you can't see with your naked eye. So as scientists, we use powerful microscopes to be able to study them, or we look at thousands or millions of individual cells of these uh, microbes growing together so we can see them with our eyes. And here on the side, I have some pictures to find ways to make microbes beautiful. <laughs> um, and I think they're really fun. So microbes are found absolutely everywhere, and there are both good microbes and there are bad microbes. And so, of course, currently, as we're living through a COVID-19 pandemic, we all understand the devastating effects that microbes can have. But I want to make sure that you know that there's a huge diversity of microbes, um, and they play such an important role, just like bats play an important role in the ecosystem. Microbes play a huge role in our world, and we couldn't live without them. So they help to make different kinds of delicious foods, like bread, yogurt, and some cheeses. They actually help us digest our food by being in our gut and helping us to break things down. They help recycle nutrients. Um, they help make us useful uh, medicines and so much more. So we really need them in our lives. OK, but you're here to talk about zombies, right? And whether it's in the movies, the TV shows, or in video games, zombies are really popping up everywhere. And so what I'd love for you to do is to let me know in the chat what your favorite zombie is. So what TV show, movie, or video game is your absolute favorite that has to do with zombies? I'd love to have a battle of the zombies and see who wins. Now, all of these zombie um, different portrayals may seem very different but they all have one thing in common. It's that microbes are causing the zombies. And you maybe didn't notice that, and maybe you don't know what the uh, microbes that are causing your zombies that are your favorite actually are. And that's okay, that's not your fault at all. Um, because a lot of the times these microbes play a really, really small role in the movies. And um, often we know that zombies can spread their infections by biting humans and passing on the zombie-causing ca agent. But they almost never really talk about what these different microbes are causing agents are. So they often use really vague terms like infection, pathogen, or contagion. 
But what we know in real life is that we can't treat infections unless we know what they are. You need to know what kind of infection you have. So the, to really understand uh, zombies, we need to understand the microbes. And so I'm gonna go into a little bit about the different, uh, different kinds of villains that can cause zombies and infections in real life. So our first villain are fungi, and these are the most closely related to humans of all of the microbes we're gonna talk about today. And they can cause infections like athlete's foot and yeast infections, as well as more um, serious infections in your bloodstream. Next, we have bacteria, which are much smaller, and you might be more, um, uh, you might know of these a little bit more. They cause a lot of different um, infections like strep throat, or even things like food poisoning. Next up, we have the villain viruses, which of course are really scary right now because we're currently dealing with COVID-19, but they also cause more uh, simple infections that are more common like flus and colds and other serious diseases like HIV. Now our last villain is someone you might not have heard of before. And these are called prions. And what's really interesting about prions is they're actually not living at all. So to explain this, first, your body is currently made up of a lot of different proteins. And these are just like building blocks. And these proteins take on a particular shape. In this case, I'm using a circle, just to demonstrate. Now, what a prion is, it's a version of one of these proteins that's lost its shape. And so it's also been lost its function because it's no longer looking like it should. But what's really dangerous about these prions is when they come into contact with a normal protein, they can then cause it to change its shape and this can lead to a massive spreading of disease as other proteins lose their shape and their function. And these prions are really scary because we really don't know how to get rid of them. Okay, so now that we know all the villains that can cause zombies in movies and video games, we need to think about, could microbes ever really cause zombies in real life? And so to do that, let's put our stethoscopes on and think about what actually is a zombie. So let's think about the symptoms. And I'd love if you would write in the chats what you think makes up a zombie. So what are the traits that you think are important? Now, I came up with a couple myself that'll go through. So first, I think that the zombies are decomposing. They lose their motor um, function, so they're maybe not moving properly. They groan, they lack commu proper communication. They're often angry and violent, and this goes hand in hand with them biting and eating people, and they use that to spread the infections. They can also be foaming at the mouth, and the most important is that they'll, they're dead, but they seem to still be moving. And this movement that they have is not controlled by their own free will. It seems like something else is controlling them. So that seems like a lot of scary symptoms, and we really need to ask ourselves, are there microbes that can cause these symptoms in real life? Because if there are, then that means zombies might actually be possible. So let's start with decomposing. So there is a kind of infection that does cause your skin to decompose and it's called necrotizing fasciitis or flesh eating disease. And this is caused by many different kinds of bacteria, but one is called Staphylococcus aureus. So what happens is normally your skin provides a protective barrier against all kinds of bu uh, bacteria and other microbes. But if you get a really, really deep cut, all of a sudden those microbes on your surface can get deep within your tissues. And that's what we're seeing in this picture here. In this cartoon, you have uh, bacteria that are deep within the tissues and are able to grow and divide. And as they do this, they release toxins that then cause damage to your cells. And this can lead to a rapid infection that causes a lot of pain, blisters changing in color, and then there then leads to death of the tissue. And as that tissue dies, then it starts to decompose. Okay, let's move on to motor problems, groaning and angriness. Are there microbes that can cause this? And the answer is yes. So um, there's a disease called bovine spongiform encephalopathy, or more commonly known as mad cow disease. And you may have heard this uh, having been a problem in the past in the UK and in Canada. Now, this is caused by a prion disease, and these prions get into the brain and spinal cord of cows. And as I mentioned before, with the prions, it can spread to different proteins in the brain and the spinal cord and slowly cause them to no longer be able to function properly. And as the spinal cord stops functioning, then the cow is no longer able to move properly and it causes them to lose their balance and coordination. 
as it causes more problems in the brain, because this can then lead to changes in behavior, anxiety, and anger. And so we really have these behavior altering traits that can make you really angry. There also is a similar disease that infects deer. Okay, so what about some of the biting and the foaming and the mouth? Well, that can easily be caused by rabies. And I have to say rabies is the number one thing that I'm scared of, um, but that's probably because I'm deathly scared of raccoons. <laughs> um, but rabies is caused by a viral infection uh, called Lissa virus, and it spreads by the scratch or bite from infected animals. And this usually comes in either raccoons, bats, or dogs. So what happens here is the virus that infects these animals causes them to change their behavior. So one thing that happens is they get very angry and aggressive and they start fighting. But one of the other things that happen is they get this weird uh, fear of water. And you might think, why would it do that? But actually it's so that the animals that are infected don't go and drink water or wash themselves. And so this means that there'll be a higher accumulation of saliva in their mouth as they start salivating more and they're not washing it away. And what's interesting about this is in that saliva is where you have all of the viral particles. And so they're getting concentrated and concentrated in the mouth. So as these animals are foaming at the mouth and then go to bite an unsuspecting victim, in that bite, there's lots of viral particles that they can then cause the transmission of the virus. So the virus is controlling the animal to help it transmit more. And what's really scary about, scary about rabies is immediate medical attention is essential. We do have ways to treat these rabies infections, um, but because it's such a serious uh, virus, we need to get medical attention quickly. Okay, now those are all simple, maybe understandable, but what about the last two? Dead, but moving, or lack of free will? That can't really happen in real life, can it? Well, first to understand this, we first need to know about parasites. And parasites are living things that grow within another living thing or host and benefit at the expense of their host. So I like to think of this as if you invited a friend over to your house and they eat all of your food, they invite all of their friends over and they throw a wild party. They're having lots of fun, but it's at your expense because you're running out of everything and your house is a big mess. So that's what a parasite is. Now, in this case, in nature, we have mind controlling infections caused by parasites. And here I'm showing you one called um, uh, the Ophiocordyceps family of parasitic fungi. And they infect insects, but especially ants. So what happens to these infected ants is as the fungi is multiplying within them, the fungi causes the ants and forces them to start climbing up on top of different sticks or leaves. And this puts the ant at a better position for the fungi to spread to different places. So once the ant climbs up, the fungi actually kills the ant and starts growing out of its dead carcass, which is kind of creepy, right? But it grows these long different project projections out of their dead carcasses and then releases fungal spores that can then be spread through the area and infect more zombies. So in this case, the fungi are actually controlling the minds of the ants to be able to further its transmission again, which is kind of really creepy. Now, recent studies suggest that these fungi might actually control the ants by releasing chemicals that control the ant muscle movement. And this is because they find that the uh, fungi are actually in the muscles of the ants and not actually located in their brains. Now next we have another mind controlling infection in nature which is caused by another fungi called Masopora and this affects cicadas. So what happens in this case is the fungi is growing inside of the cicadas and basically is hollowing out the cicada to the point where the abdomen of the cicada completely falls off and instead you get this big plug of fungi that is growing out of it. So this big white plug here is all fungi. What happens then is even though the cicada is dying, it's decaying, sorry, um, it still acts completely normally to the point where none of the other cicadas notice anything different. So it's flying around and as it's flying around, parts of this fungi can release out and spread. And they call this the salt shaker fungi um, because it releases like a salt shaker as the cicadas fly. 
The other thing the fungi does, which is really creepy, is it makes these cicadas hypersexualized. So these cicadas are more uh, excited to mate with all different kinds of cicadas. And this again helps the transmission of the fungi as these other safe or uninfected cicadas come to mate with these infected cicadas. So it's kind of really disgusting in a way that the fungi are controlling this almost dead organism just for its benefit. And recent studies have identified that the fungi actually produce psychoactive compounds as well as compounds like uh, amphetamines, which are a good way um, to suggest why they can alter, how they can alter their behavior. Okay, so now that we looked at all these different symptoms and I found you examples of places in nature where we have microbes that can cause these infections, we really need to know, does that mean that zombies could happen in real life? Should I be scared? And the answer is, it's incredibly unlikely. So in a lot of these cases, I've showed you infections um, that were happening only in animals and aren't able to infect humans. And while we do see cases of um, humans getting infections from animals, they aren't super likely, especially if you're coming from an animal that's very distantly related, like an insect. It'd be really hard for a fungi who knows how to infect an insect that then in infect and control a whole human. We also talked about a lot of different microbes that only had one or two of these symptoms. So it'd be really hard to get a microbe that caused all of these symptoms. But uh, I like to think with science, nothing's ever impossible. So I guess you never know. Now, the best way to protect yourself against an, a zombie apocalypse, if it ever were to happen, would be the same way to protect yourself against COVID-19 or any other pathogen. So this would be wash your hands frequently, avoid touching your eyes, mouth, and nose, and cover your cough or sneezes with uh, your elbow or tissues. And this just helps to stop the spread of infections, stops microbes that are pathogenic from getting inside of you and then making you sick because when you're sick, you are more susceptible to subsequent infections. So it's always good to keep your immune system strong and to stay healthy. Next, a pretty good idea to stay uh, at least six feet apart of, from any prospective zombies, just so they can't attack you, just in case. Um, also staying at home as much as possible um, during these times when we know that there are infected people out there. If there was a zombie apocalypse all around, you'd probably want to stay at home with your door shut and locked. And lastly, if you have symptoms to seek out medical care because sometimes doctors know the answers or a lot of times doctors know the answers and can help you to try and make you feel better. Okay, but I know what you're really asking is, okay, but that's not really what I came here to learn about. I really want to know what is the best way to kill a zombie. And so I would love if you would all write in the chat what you think is the best way to kill a zombie. There's lots of different ideas, but I wonder which one is the best. So to start, I will absolutely say that the movies, the video games, and the TV shows get this 100% wrong. Um, they absolutely almost always take an approach like this, uh, where how to kill your zombie is to choose your weapon, maybe a baseball bat, aim for the head, and don't miss. But based off of everything I've told you, this is a bad idea. <laughs> so first of all, if you pick a baseball bat and you have to hit them over the head, you're coming way too close in contact with that zombie, and that's leaving lots of opportunity for them to share their infection with you. Next, if you hit them in the head and you spread all of this blood and guts everywhere, now you have infected blood and guts that is spread everywhere. That's a way, way, way terrible way to do it because now you have all of those fluids that you can catch the infection from. So not good, the movies are all wrong. So the answer instead is fire. So uh, my expert microbiologist opinion is flamethrowers is the best way to go, keep your distance, but throw the fire, and this will help to destroy the body without spreading those infectious bodily fluids. We also know in the research labs that fire and heat are really effective at killing different kinds of microbes, and they'll also uh, melt the brains of the zombies. So I think this is the surefire way to do it. And thank you, and feel free to reach out if you have any other questions. Thank you so much, uh, Amanda, for that. That was really great. I think uh, we're all empowered to know what to do <laughs> when a zombie comes. Um, yeah, I think someone suggested to stick a pencil in their ear. Do you think that would 
be helpful. <laughs> yeah. So again, I think you would have to come way too close to the zombie to ever make that effective. And staying far away is very important. <laughs> yes, definitely. Um, I think we all have good practice with that now. Exactly. Um, <laughs> so we've had some, uh, I guess we've heard that like mad cow disease this is sort of like this inf misinformation that we're hearing about transmitting to humans potentially. Can you comment on that a little bit? Yeah, absolutely. So um, lots of places will say that um, people were able to get mad cow disease by infecting, sorry, by eating infected cow meat um, and that this would cause a disease called Kreutzfeldt Kreutzfeld Jakob disease. Um, and while that disease does exist and does cause neurodegeneration, there is not good evidence that this has come actually from eating infected meat and that the mad cow disease is transmitting into humans. So I think that um, there's definitely a lot of misinformation around that. That's really good to know. Yeah. Um, and I guess this, uh, sorry, this question might relate a little bit to what we were just talking about. Um, do you think that chronic wasting disease, also known as zombie deer disease, has the possibility to transfer to humans through infected meat, or would other humans pass it to each other by bites? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I was reading up about this a little bit last night. Um, I think that we, there is no evidence to suggest that that um, is able to pass through humans eating infected meat. Um, it is, again, anything is possible, but we don't have data to support that right now. I think we do know that other infections and other microbes can um, spread by eating infected meat, um, but in those cases of mad cow or chronic wasting disease, we, we don't have evidence of that. Um, I think what can happen with a lot of infectious disease is, um, especially ones like that, that are transferred um, through vectors like uh, mosquitoes. Um, we know that if a mosquito eats you and can transfer the disease to you, then another mosquito can come and bite you and take the infection and bring it to somebody else as well. So I think um, it is possible to spread it through vectors. Okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know specifically if that one spreads um, through vectors, but yeah. Okay. Good to know. More, more research. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, we've also heard um, the Ontario Poison Control announced uh, October 1st that they're seeing an increase in cases of mushroom poisoning because people are foraging more and IDing mushrooms is really tricky because they look like poisonous ones versus non poisonous ones look very similar. Do you have any like advice on on sort of people who want to do that <laughs> yeah i think uh it's really cool that uh foraging mushrooms has become such a popular thing um and i love it because i love um seeing everybody's cool mushroom pictures on twitter um so if anybody wants to see some of the coolest microbes ever and mushrooms ever i would definitely check out twitter um, but I would say at all times, unless you are an expert mycologist and know everything about um, mushrooms, I would never eat anything that you pick. I think foraging is very dangerous and it's just not worth the risk because a lot of um, really poisonous mushrooms look exactly identical to um, the edible kinds. And so I, I think it's a, a it's really nice to go out in the forest and try to find mushrooms and I think it's pretty and it's great to appreciate them um, but I think it's not worth the risk um, to try to eat them thinking that you've ID'd them properly. Right that's really that's a really good tip. Um, another thing that we've seen is the mushroom death suit. I, I have a picture here it's from Science Alert. Um, any like initial thoughts just seeing this picture? <laughs> I feel like this picture is so ridiculous i don't even know what's going on <laughs> and that's why i felt like i had to show it just because it's the picture itself like it needs to be seen. no totally like it looks like the person is trapped in a spider web <laughs> um yeah so the suit apparently relies on the power of mic Myco remediation. Um, so it's the ability for mushrooms to clean up toxic contaminants in the environment. And the founder chose this strain of mushrooms, um, fun fact, by feeding them her hair and nails. Um, and another fun fact is actor Luke Perry was actually buried in one last year. Oh. Yeah. And that and, and became really popular because of that. So what are your thoughts on, on this mushroom suit? 
Yeah, um, I think it's cool that people are taking things that happen in nature naturally and trying to be resourceful for them and trying to find new solutions to problems. I think um, we're all focused on trying to have a smaller um, effect on the environment. And I think funerals is definitely a difficult one with all of the um, toxic embalming chemicals and, you know, um, making expensive coffins out of wood and stuff like that. So I think it's cool that they're coming up with innovative solutions. Um, but I also think if you were to take a body and not wrap it in mushrooms and throw it in the ground, it would decay. <laughs> um, <laughs> because that's what happens to all living organisms in the wild. Um, animals die all the time. And uh, in the ground, there's lots of mushrooms there. There's lots of different microbes that all work together to cause decomposition. So I don't necessarily need, think you need a mushroom suit in order to de decay. <laughs> okay, <laughs> good to know. Uh, and then there's like another coffin-like thing. Uh, very, I, I don't know, it's a creepy photo, I think, in a way. Yeah. <laughs> Weirdly staged. But this <laughs> is from, I think this photo is from Green Matters and CBC also did an article similar to this. Um, this is the loop cocoon casket and it's also made of mycelium, so the underground root structure of mushrooms, if I have that correct. Yeah. Um, and then according to the founder, it's used in Chernobyl to clean up the soil from the nuclear dis disaster. And the same thing happens in our burial places because the soil is super polluted there and mycelium really likes metals, oils, and microplastics. It provides nutrients to the plants growing around it. It can neutralize toxic substances, substances and it can clean up soil by converting waste products into nutrients. Yeah. <laughs> so first of all, I think it, it would be really creepy if they left the coffins like that and didn't yeah. bury them. I think you would definitely especially, want to bury them. Especially the one like right leaning against the tree. Yeah, <laughs> leaning against the tree would be a bad way to 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 go. Um, but what I would say here is I think I think it's it is an interesting idea to cut down on the amount of trees that we're using um, to build coffins. So I think like that's cool. Um, I think maybe an approach to take would be to use less toxic chemicals in embalming if your goal is to get the body to decompose. I think our current like um, funeral practices in Canada are usually made there, people are embalmed to keep them from decaying and then they have are buried in such intense caskets so that they don't decay rapidly. And I think if we moved um, to a different realm where we, if the goal was to decay more, we would just, have funerals quicker, so there wasn't enough time for them to decay without embalming. And then I think using innovative um, materials for coffins, I think could be environmentally friendly. So I think it's a cool idea. Um, yeah. <laughs> but there are still mushrooms in the ground. <laughs> yes, <laughs> we can still rely on those ones for sure. Um, exactly. Yeah, it's really interesting. I think we're all talking a lot about um, what to do, you know, at the end of our life in terms of, you know, burial sites and even um uh i forgot the cremation there we go yeah because um, like even i i mean i always thought cremation was nice just because you know you, you save space but also um i think the burning produces um some toxic gases and and not quite so environmentally friendly so i think yeah it's it's good to keep thinking about these ideas we have one question who really likes this uh death uh theme that we're going with. Um, yeah. But if you dispose a body in the desert, what would happen? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, okay, I listened to a horrifying uh, podcast about this once um, that I, I'm trying to think of, it was one of the, I don't know, it was probably This American Life or Radio Lab. It was probably Radio Lab about, um, and it was on immigration and um, about people that um, are trying to immigrate into the states and have to cross the desert, and that it, how it's a really long trek and that it's really harsh conditions and a lot of people don't make the trip and they end up dying, and um, that they're in the desert and what would happen to them. And so they, what they did was they uh, simulated um, the situation with a carcass and um, then watch what would happen over time to see if it would decay faster or slower. And it actually decayed super, super fast um, because of the heat, but also because there's so much uh, wildlife out there. So they had like um, lots of birds that would um, eat the body and lots of different animals that would come. So maybe it wasn't uh, 
decomposing, but within a couple of days, the whole carcass was um, oh. gone, which is horrifying. It is, um, yeah. <laughs> but I, so I, I guess in a way, it's like anywhere the body is, decomposition will sort of happen in some shape or form. Um, exactly. Different, yeah. Exactly. Um, we have another question about what is the scariest microbe you've ever encountered in a lab? Hopefully in a lab. <laughs> is the <Yes>. question. <laughs> so um, Canada has really strict guidelines for working with microbes in the lab. So we do not work with anything super scary. Um, and if you do, there's like uh, special labs in Winnipeg that have like the super high secure uh, areas that can work on the scariest microbes. So in a normal lab at the University of Toronto, we work on pretty low key things. Um, but I really think that um, the scariest microbes that we have to worry about right now are ones that are resistant to the drugs that we have available. So right now we're having a huge problem with antibiotic resistance and as well as antifungal resistance and resistance um, to all of the different biological agents that we have to kill these infections. And that's a lot because of misuse of antibiotics, especially in um, farming and in um, uh, growing animals uh, for consumption. And so I think that what scientists are really afraid of are these superbugs that one day could make it so that regular um, procedures like surgeries um, will be impossible to have because you'll get an infection from the hospital and we won't have a way to, to treat it. So mm -hmm. I think superbugs are definitely the scariest. I agree. I agree. <laughs> Thank you so much, Amanda, for all of your uh, great answers and uh, your presentation, of course. It was very fun and also a little bit scary, but reassuring <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> so thank you so much. <laughs>